Good morning, friends, and welcome to worship uh, online at Blythwood Road Baptist Church. This is worship for Sunday, April the 10th. It's Palm Sunday, and uh, we pray that your time spent uh, worshiping with us uh, here online will be a blessing uh, to you as we're blessed to be able to worship, worship here together. This morning, we're looking at uh, the story of Jesus' entry into Jerusalem. This is where we've been moving all through these weeks of Lent. We're going to be looking at, uh, at the story as Mark tells it, which is a mixture of, of symbols of, of kingliness as well as great humility. It's a story of a, a relatively muted Palm Sunday celebration, which, uh, which ends in silence. So what does this story have to tell us as we enter Holy Week, as we enter this week in which we're moving toward Good Friday and Easter Sunday? Let's find out. Let's worship together. In terms of announcements, I would just like to, uh, to announce our, our services for, for next weekend on Good Friday. In God's will, we're going to meet here at 1030. Um, for Good Friday, our Good Friday service, and we're welcoming the Reverend Bonnie Parsons from Western Park Baptist Church. So we're looking forward uh, to seeing uh, Reverend Parsons that day here, and she's going to bring God's word, and that's at 1030. And then on Easter Sunday morning, um, again, our service will be at, uh, at 1030, and we're looking forward to this. And, uh, and I'll say, too, that we plan to have some sort of a fellowship time, which will involve some kind of food, some sort of ability to, to get together. And, uh, and break bread together. And, uh, and we're looking forward to this as well. And at the same time, we, uh, we'll, we, we will be planning to, uh, to, to, to have worship opportunities available online, uh, again, uh, for both Good Friday and Easter Sunday. So uh, we're, we're hopeful that, that you'll be able to join us um, one way or another and that, and that it will be a blessing for all. As we prepare to worship now, friends, let's come before God in prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, um, we thank you for this day and, uh, and for the event, Father, that we mark this day, Jesus' entry into Jerusalem. And, and we pray this morning, Father, may, as we echo the cry of, of Hosanna, may it be our prayer, save us now, save us, we pray. And may it also, Lord, be a cry on our part of adulation and praise as we sing Hosanna to the King. So be near us now, Father, and speak to us and speak through um, our words, our songs, our prayers, our silences, all that happens here over this next hour or so. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hear the call to worship, friends. Hosanna. Save us, we beseech you, O Lord. O Lord, we beseech you. Give us success. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. Amen. We're going to praise God now together. We're going to sing Hosanna, loud Hosanna, um, a great old hymn. And then we're going to sing a newer song, which is called Hosanna to the King. We, uh, we introduced this last year. This one, it's kind of more for the kids. It goes, Hosanna, na, 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 Hosanna, na, na, if you remember, in the chorus. But of course... The adults will enjoy it too. So let's praise God together now.
Our first scripture reading this morning is uh, from the Gospel of Mark. Both scripture readings are from the Gospel of Mark, but we're going to start with Mark chapter 8, um, reading from verse 22 through to verse 30. So let, let's hear the word of the Lord. They came to Bethsaida. Some people brought a blind man to him and begged him to touch him. He took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the village. And when he had put saliva on his eyes and laid his hands on him, he asked him, Can you see anything? And the man looked up and said, I can see people, but they look like trees walking. Then Jesus laid his hands on his eyes again, and he looked intently, and his sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. Then he sent him away to his home, saying, Do not even go into the village. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi, and on the way he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist, and others Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. He asked them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, you are the Messiah. And he sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. And then moving over to uh, chapter 10, starting from verse 46. They came to Jericho. As he and his disciples and a large crowd were leaving Jericho, Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, a blind beggar, was sitting by the roadside. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many sternly ordered him to be quiet, but he cried out even more loudly, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stood still and said, Call him here. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart. Get up. He is calling you. So throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. Then Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, My teacher, let me see again. Jesus said to him, Go. Your faith has made you well. 
Immediately he regained his sight and followed him on the way. When they were approaching Jerusalem at Bethpage and Bethany near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Just say this, The Lord needs it, and he will send it back here immediately. They went away and found a colt tied near a door outside in the street. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, What are you doing untying the colt? They told them what Jesus had said, and, and they allowed them to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. And this is the word of the Lord. We thank God for the reading of it and for the hearing of it this day. Amen. Amen. Our marking of Palm Sunday this year, um, it seems a little more muted, doesn't it? It, it seems a little more low-key, uh, maybe, than usual. If, if we're gathering in churches on Palm Sunday, our, our gatherings might be a, a little smaller than usual. And, um, and if we're not able to get to a church and we're, 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 we're worshiping from at home, uh, of course, our, 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 our marking of this day is, is a little more low-key than it might be if we were together. And in that way, I think the story, as Mark tells it, of Jesus entering, in, in, entering into Jerusalem and, and, and the way that, that, that this story is itself somewhat muted, I, I think it's very fitting. I think it's fitting for us to hear this story, this story that... That, 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 that ends in, in silence, that ends in Jesus going to the temple at the end of the day and ends in silence. It's a story many of us have heard, of course, so many times, and it's a story that we, that we always come back to every Palm Sunday and every, every time we, 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 we begin Holy Week. There's no mention of palms here. Um, notice in Mark 11. There's no mention of palms. There's no mention of palms in Matthew or Luke for that matter. It's, uh, it's John who gives us that detail. It's the Gospel of John from which we get the detail of the palms. Uh, there's no uproar in the city. There's no general sensation being caused by Jesus' arrival. There's no turmoil. There's nothing to attract the attention of Pharisees in Mark's story. There, there's no talk of, of, of the whole world has gone after him that we hear in other accounts of Jesus' entry. There's no talk even of Jesus as son of David. There's no talk of Jesus as king here on the part of the crowd. And there's no talk of it from Jesus either. And as I said, the story ends in silence and Jesus is in fact silent once he gives his instructions. He doesn't speak again in this story. And what I would like for us to do this week Dear friends, I'd like us to sit with the silence of Jesus as much as we can, both today and as we go through this incoming week. And let us sit with silence and let us continue to consider this question that we've been considering. Who then is this? Who then is this? And who then are we as his followers? And we have this picture here in our story in, in Mark 11. We have this picture of Jesus astride a young donkey. And we'll borrow the detail that it was a donkey from the other gospel writers. Jesus is not speaking. His feet barely clear the ground as Jesus rides on this donkey. This is not a Roman ruler. This is not a Roman emperor coming in wearing a red cape and riding a white horse in triumphant procession. Look, your king is coming. What kind of king is this? Who then is this? And the scene fades into a flashback. 
And we flashed back to chapter 8. We heard a story about Jesus causing a blind man to see in Bethsaida from Mark chapter 8. We read about Jesus laying his hands on a man. And then, laying, then Jesus laying his hands on the man again. And there's this progression happening in this man's ability to see. And we read the story and we say, we say, Lord, lay your hands on us. Lord, lay your hands on me. Help us to see. Help me to see. Help me to see everything in your light. Help us to see who you are ever more clearly. Who is he? Well, who do people say that he is? And that scene fades into the next one in chapter 8 as, as Jesus and his disciples, they're heading north. They're heading north to Caesarea Philippi. And Caesarea Philippi, it's a, it's a little removed from Galilee where Jesus and his followers have been operating. All the stories that we've been looking at have been taking place in Galilee. Caesarea Philippi is up north. It's a town named for an emperor. And it's filled with edifices which are dedicated to the gods of the world because we like to build edifices dedicated to, to our gods. It's a town in, in what, what's today known as the Golan Heights. It's close to the Syrian border and, and you can visit it. And, and, and I hope you get the chance, if you haven't one day, I've been able to visit it. It's, it's, it's amazing to, 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 to be there and to sit where, where the scene happened. And Jesus and his followers here, they're far enough away from where they've been operating in Galilee. They're far enough away for a measure of objectivity to come into play here. And an objective question is asked. Jesus asked an objective question, and this is it. He says, who do people say that I am? And they answer him. They say, John the Baptist, and others, Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. And this makes sense, because as we know, prophets tell forth. Prophets tell you what's going on. And we remember those opening scenes from when we started all those weeks ago, when we started our journey through Mark. We remember those opening scenes where Jesus is on the move and he's speaking and his message is the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God has come near. This is the message. Jesus is talking about what's going on. Just like a prophet, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of, of God has come near. But of course, that's not the end of Jesus' message because Jesus also says, repent and believe the good news. Jesus issues an invitation. God's plan is in motion. The kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God is within our reach. Turn, Jesus says, and believe. Turn and trust in him. Rest in him. That's always the invitation, and may we always make it and accept it. Because Jesus is not here with the disciples to simply ask objective questions. We're not here to simply pose objective questions or to have a philosophical discussion or a hypothetical discussion. Caesarea Philippi might be far enough away to view things objectively, but if one looks south, one can see the lake. I'm talking about the Sea of Galilee, which is really a lake. If one looks south, one can see the lake. One can see the Jordan River Valley. One can see down the Jordan River Valley, looking toward Jerusalem, where this story was always going. This was always where the story was going. And as we look south over Galilee, we remember, we remember images of, of John the Baptist and Jesus in the river. And we, we, we remember the heavens being torn apart. New situation. And we remember the Spirit descending like a dove. And we see Jesus. We, we see Jesus walking along beside the lake. And we see him stopping by two sets of brothers and issuing that invitation. Follow me. We see people, we remember stories of people being made whole, scenes of people being made whole. We see people asking, who does he think he is? We see people being forgiven. We see people being made new. We see people rejecting him. We see Jesus in a boat 
telling the wind and the waves to shut up, muzzle your step. And it happens. These are all the things we see as we sit with Jesus and the disciples at Caesarea Philippi. Don't take this man lightly. Let us not take this man lightly as he asks the question directly now of Peter, of the disciples, of us. Who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? And Peter, ever impetuous, steps up, ever ready to take the lead. You are the Messiah, he says. You are the Messiah. You're the chosen one. You are the anointed one. You are the Christ, in other words. And then Jesus tells them, he says, don't tell anyone. Because at that point, it wasn't quite time yet. But the time now has arrived. Your king comes to you, gentle, and riding on a donkey. Who then is this? What kind of king is this? And we think of the, of the shout of Hosanna. And literally, Hosanna means save us now, or save us, Lord, we pray. We can't help but recall what happened as Jesus and his followers made their way out of Jericho. On their way to Jerusalem, they passed through Jericho. It's a city about 800 feet below sea level. So you're always going up. You're moving up as you go from Jericho up to Jerusalem. And as they're leaving Jericho, we read, just at the end of chapter 10, Jesus and his disciples and a large crowd were leaving Jericho. A blind man was begging alongside the road. Bartimaeus which means son of Timaeus. And we can infer here that he must have become famous to be named like that, Bartimaeus. He must have become Christian famous anyway, or as I like to say, big in Baptist circles. And Bartimaeus is begging by the side of the road. And he cries out, he says, son of David, he cries, have mercy on me. And, 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 and he's crying out. And, and, and the word used here, it literally means shriek. He's shrieking. People tell him to be quiet. How unseemly, after all, to let our need be known. This kind of thing is not done. Bartimaeus cried ever more loudly. He shrieked ever more loudly. Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus says, What do you want me to do for you? And Bartimaeus answers and he says, My teacher, let me see again. Let me see again. And I say, dear friends, may this be our prayer. Lord, help us to see. And Jesus answers him and he says, Go, your faith has made you well. Your faith has saved you, literally. Your faith has saved you. And Bartimaeus certainly didn't understand everything at that point. And in a few weeks' time, he would understand more. But here's the thing. Like countless others, Bartimaeus came away from an encounter with Jesus, made whole, transformed, given new life. And so we read immediately, Bartimaeus regained his sight and followed Jesus on his way. So as Jesus and his followers go on and leave Jericho and begin their their, their, uh, ascent into Jerusalem, or to Jerusalem, Bartimaeus is now part of the crowd. And the time has come as we begin chapter 11. The time is here. Kingdom time is here. And there'll be no more need to keep quiet. But even now, the scene is is cloaked in ambiguity. Mark, as I said earlier, Mark is keeping things very subtle here. This entry is hardly what you would call triumphant. And I think we do well to consider that in our silence today and in our silence through the week. I think we do well to consider here how elements of kingliness are mixed in with elements of humility 
and elements of silence. And these point toward the truth that this king who is coming into Jerusalem, that the way of this king is the way of suffering, it's the way of death, and this is all part of God's plan. Good Friday, the crucifixion is not a bump in the road. It's not the plans going awry. The things that will happen to Jesus in Jerusalem are not simply being done to Jesus. They're all part of God's plan. They're all part of Jesus' way. Three times after all, between Caesarea Philippi and Jerusalem, Jesus tells his disciples, he says, the Son of Man is to be betrayed into human hands and they will kill him. And three days after being killed, he will rise again. That's from 931, Mark 931. So this is the plan. The plan is in motion. They're at Bethpage and Bethany, where Mary, Martha, and Lazarus live. And at that point, we read that Jesus sends two disciples he sends two disciples into the village because we're not meant to do this walk alone. He sends two of them and he says, go into the village ahead of you and, and immediately as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Just say the Lord needs it and we'll send it back immediately. That's verse two to four. Was this divine knowledge that Jesus had or had he made an arrangement for the cult? We don't know. We don't know. Was Jesus, when Jesus said, Lord, the Lord needs it, did he mean himself? Did he mean God? Did he mean the cult's owner? We don't know. But we do know this. A divine plan is being carried out here. Jesus is calling for a cult that had never been ridden, which, which denoted a, a sacred purpose. In other words, God's purpose. And he's invoking, he's using the name here, Lord. And as I said, those are the last words Jesus speaks. And he's not going to be speaking in this scene. But his entry into Jerusalem on a donkey's colt speaks for him. This was not done. You didn't enter Jerusalem riding a horse or a colt or a donkey. Even Alexander the Great was persuaded to enter Jerusalem on foot. When it came time for Alexander the Great to enter Jerusalem, he was persuaded to do so on foot because it wasn't done to ride in. And of course, we flash back and we can flash back all the way to First Kings. First Kings chapter 1 where King Solomon, Solomon is entering Jerusalem and he's entering Jerusalem on a mule. And I'm going to read, this is Solomon, or sorry, 1 Kings 1, 37, or 38. So the priest Zadok, the prophet Nathan, and Benaiah, son of Jehoiada, and the Cherethites and the Pelethites went down and had Solomon ride on King David's mule and led him to Gihon. There the priest Zadok took the horn of oil from the tent and anointed Solomon. Then they blew the trumpet and all the people said, Long live King Solomon, the son of David, the one who was named for peace. So you see what's happening, because here a greater than Solomon is here, and he's humble and he's riding on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And so they fashion a saddle out of cloaks for Jesus to sit on. We read, many spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut from the field. This is not something that you would just do for anyone. It's not something you would do for a friend, even a good friend. It's how you would greet a king. And when you reach the top of the Mount of Olives, you, you get your first sight of Jerusalem. You see Jerusalem there. And when you see Jerusalem, it's cause for shouting. It's cause for singing. It's cause for celebration. And they sing, the, the, the people going with Jesus sing a pilgrim song, a, a traveler's song. And it's from a psalm, and it's, it's from a psalm that recalled, it's Psalm 118, it's a psalm that recalled the saving power of God in bringing God's people out of Egypt. It's Passover time after all. And it's kingdom time. And it goes like this. 
Hosanna. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. And this is their song. And this is how the song goes from Psalm 118. This is Psalm 118, 25 to 26. Save us, we beseech you, O Lord. O Lord, we beseech you, give us success. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. This was a pilgrim song. And I want us to pay attention to what's happening here. This was a pilgrim song. And pilgrims, or people who were on the way, they would sing this as they were on their way to the holy city. And we are a pilgrim people. We who follow Christ are a pilgrim people. And this is our pilgrim song. And this is our king. And to count yourself as a follower of Christ, dear friend, means that this is your story. That this is your song. And so we sing Hosanna. We sing save Lord we pray. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Amen. And may that ever be our song. Those who went with him. Those ahead of him. And those who followed him. Were shouting. They were shouting. And they were singing. And then nothing. And it's not really nothing, but sound wise, not a lot. The crowd, as we get to the end of the scene, the crowd that went with him seems to have dispersed. They're not mentioned again here in the scene anyway. But that's okay, because the kingdom of God is not like a crowd. Jesus never told the parable about the kingdom of God being like the adulation of a crowd. And Jesus is silent here. Jesus is silent. And this is how the scene ends. Then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple, and when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. He entered Jerusalem. He went to the temple when he looked around at everything as it was already late. It's the end of the day. Darkness is falling. We have darkness. We have silence. And he went out to Bethany with the twelve. And someone has said this about how this, how this story ends here in verse 11. Someone has said this, Jesus is Lord of the temple who must inspect its premises to determine whether the purpose intended by God is being fulfilled. I'm going to read that again. Jesus is Lord of the temple who must inspect its premises to determine whether the purpose intended by God is being fulfilled. And so, dear friends, dear sisters and brothers, let us take those words to heart. Let we who are God's temple, let we who are God's temple and let we who are the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit take those words to heart. And may we take the time this week to stand before this silent Jesus, this Jesus who's not speaking, as we wait. Lent is a time of waiting. And it's a time of preparation to celebrate our crucified and risen King. And this week that we're entering now, it's a special one, even in that time of waiting. It's kingdom time. It's restoration time. It's redemption time. And may Jesus find us as Jesus searches our hearts and we ask God and we ask the Spirit and we ask the Son of God to search our hearts and we ask God and we ask the Son of God and we ask the Holy Spirit to give us eyes to see and ears to hear and hearts to understand. As that's happening, may Jesus find us.
each of us, fulfilling the purposes which God intends. May that be our prayer for ourselves and for one another as we enter this week. And now we're going to sit in silence, and I'm, I'm going to give us a chance to sit in some silence and hear from God's Word. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until tribute comes to him. And the obedience of the peoples is his, binding his foal to the vine and his donkey's colt to the choice vine. On that day, the deaf shall hear the words of a scroll. And out of their gloom and darkness, the eyes of the blind shall see. The meek shall obtain fresh joy in the Lord. And the neediest people shall exult in the Holy One of Israel. Save us, we beseech you, O Lord. O Lord, we beseech you, give us success. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the good news of God and saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. And Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you fish for people. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Your sins are forgiven. He said to them, Why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? He asked them, but who do you say that I am? Amen. As we respond to God's word to us, uh, we're going to sing. And um, the song is called From the Inside Out. We're, we're talking about uh, coming before God in silence. We're talking about um, Jesus searching our hearts, about our hearts being transformed, about um, our, 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 our hearts being changed by the, the fire of the Holy Spirit consuming us from the inside and that it would be manifest. Uh, in our lives, in our words, in our deeds. So this is what this song reflects, this desire. So may it be both our prayer now and our desire as we sing.
for many, music is, um, is such a big part of, um, of how we know God and of how we seek God and of how we're transformed by God. And we're talking a lot about singing this morning. And this morning, we're going to hear, we're going to continue with, uh, with the words of witness that we've been hearing. And this morning, we're going to hear from our sister Nora, for whom, for whom music has been um, very healing. So, Nora... Welcome, and we're, uh, we're looking forward to hearing from you. Uh, the lovely thing about becoming a Christian when very young is that when you're older, you have a very long history of God's faithfulness to look back on. Uh, God is easier to trust after decades of proving to be trustworthy. So uh, I've learned that when doors of opportunity present themselves to me uh, that I believe are in God's will, I've learned to leap at them. Often uh, my enthusiasm is rewarded on the other side of the door uh, with more than I could ever have imagined. Uh, God can make unimaginable things happen uh, to bring his will into fruition. However, I also have found myself leaping at that door just as it swings shut. Suddenly tiny obstacles become completely impassable and simple tasks become impossible. Uh, as painful as those times are, to me uh, they're also really clear examples of God being faithful. Now, in my life God can be trusted to bar my way when I leap too far or too fast. Uh, just like when driving through the mountains, I've learned to be very grateful for the guardrails. Um, Christmas of 2020, I found myself in a very sad place. Uh, I had not sung formally in, in about 10 months, and I didn't know how badly I missed it. Um, I was also grieving the loss of my dad, who had passed away before Thanksgiving that year, and I felt that perhaps singing with Pastor Abby and the worship team would be a good way to repay Blythewood for its kindness to my parents. Um, the problem was uh, that the team rehearsed on Thursdays, every Thursday, during the day. Uh, I have a day job and a day job that I very much wanted to keep. Um, I work as a corporate law clerk, which means that I am an assistant to about a dozen people. Uh, and my whole job description is to be there when they call, whenever they call. So my bosses are lovely, um, but there is no way that I could ask them for every Thursday off in perpetuity. <laughs> so what should I do? So I asked my mom. And she thought my singing in public was a fantastic idea, but she's hardly an impartial judge in this case. Bless her. Uh, I thought about staying silent and watching the pastor shoulder the Sunday services burden all alone while my voice you know, atrophied from disuse. Um, eventually, I decided to leap at the door and see if it was open. So uh, better to fail trying, I thought, than to fail to try. So if my bosses objected and they forced me to quit singing on Thursdays, I would face that stressful moment when it came. It would be evidence that the door was shut. Um, so that first Thursday in January of 2021, I left my home office at lunchtime and the traffic was unfriendly and the rehearsal went along and I didn't get back home again until about 4 p.m. And when I got back to my home desk, I opened my computer and I saw that my phone had not rung once. And my emails had been astoundingly silent all afternoon. Uh, the second Thursday, I hurled myself at the door again and I gave my word to Pastor David that I could come every Thursday until my bosses called us all back in to work in the office. So from that moment on, Every single Thursday while I was rehearsing, my phone was silent and my email requests were either non-existent or non-urgent. Month after month, God was faithful. Not once did any kind of legal emergency request happen on a Thursday afternoon. Is God faithful? 
As if to further confirm his sovereignty, uh, the day after Pastor David ended our Thursday rehearsals, I got a surprise call from one of my bosses saying that the plans had changed and he needed me to come back to working full time in the office right away. So the week after the pastor no longer needed me was the very week I was no longer available. God had been faithful my whole life, faithful to open doors and faithful to close them. I'm so glad that I learned very young how God can be trusted. Uh, 2021 became a year of musical healing, of friendship and fellowship in a new family of believers. Um, I sang on Thursdays to say thank you to Jennifer, to Pastor Abby, to Pastor David, to Adolfo, and to Dan. But God let me sing on Thursdays because he knew how much I needed all of you. Thank you. As we continue to respond to God's word, we're going to come before God now with the prayers of God's people. So let's pray. Almighty and gracious God, our hearts are lifted this day and we rejoice. As we lift palms and holy hands toward you, so now do we lift praises and prayers, confident that you hear us, confident that you abide with us still. Merciful God, on this day we shout Hosanna, God save. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. And in doing so, we join our voices with the company of saints throughout time and place from the ancient temple of Jerusalem to the streets of our city today, who forever sing your praises. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. As, these, as we say these words of welcome, as Jesus enters the blessed city and sets into motion the events of Holy Week, may this shout of joy and anticipation be for us also, Lord, a call to action. May we too come in the name of the Lord. May we too go out into the world in the name of the Lord, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God, bringing your kingdom to life here and now. May this story transform our very built beings that filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, we would proclaim with joy the great and awesome day of the Lord, a day of peace and justice, a day of equality and righteousness a day of healing and wholeness, of love and compassion. Lord, as we embark this morning down the mysterious and wondrous path toward the cross, may we never forget that this day comes at a cost, that before this week is through, we will suffer the greatest loss, but also enjoy the greatest victory. Great indeed is the mystery of our faith. Precious Lord, Hold us in your tender mercy this week. Strengthen us to run the course you've laid before us. Comfort us when we grow weary. Shield us when we are attacked. Love us with your unending love. Gracious God, fill us now with your Holy Spirit, that as we enter Jerusalem with Jesus, we might be transformed into his likeness to be your presence here in this city and wherever we may be. Even now, do this, Lord, as we join our voices with his in the prayer that he taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. As we're sent from this time of worship, friends, we're going to sing again. And uh, the hymn is right on, right on in majesty. It reminds us that this Jesus who we're celebrating today, this Jesus who was riding into Jerusalem, is our crucified and our risen Lord. So let's sing.
Friends, as we go from this time of worship and as we, as we move into Holy Week, may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and, and give you peace. Go now in the peace of Christ. Amen. Amen.